Hi everyone, so today we have a really nice and short question about primes and perfect cubes. So we're going to have some classic number theory and divisibility techniques involved here. So yeah, let's just begin. So this is problem number two from the Balkan Math Olympiad in the year 2005. And in this video, we're going to be looking at primes and perfect cubes, divisibility techniques, some book sessions for senior Olympiads, and at the end, a similar but tragic problem. This video is sponsored by Chinta.com. Since 2010, Chinta has trained thousands of students from all around the world in mathematical olympiads, physics olympiads, computer science and informatics olympiads, ISI CMI entrances, and research projects for school and college students. So what does it state? So we need to find all primes P so that P square minus P plus 1 is a perfect cube. Now, this is probably the most common type of number theory problems that we come across and there are really only some standard ways to do them. And we're going to look at one of them, which I feel is quite fundamental, but at the same time, quite nice. So I'm just going to let P square minus P plus one will be equal to X cube for obviously some natural number X, right? And then what I can maybe do is I can just notice that if I just send this one to the right hand side, it becomes like a factorizable expression. And in general, in number theory or even in algebra, if you can factorize stuff, it's probably good to do that. So P square minus P is equal to X cube minus one. So this can be factorized at P times P minus one is equal to X minus one times X square plus X plus one. Pretty standard factorization of X cube minus one. Okay, great. So now I really can divide this into two cases very easily. Case one is when P divides X minus one and case two would be simply when p divides this other quantity, right? Or maybe something else, let's see. So the case one that I'm probably gonna consider is when p divides x minus one, right? So what does this imply? So this implies that x squared plus x plus one divides p minus one. How does this make sense? Well, if p divides x minus one, that x minus one is the larger quantity, right? And p is the smaller quantity. Now, you see, we have this equality sign in the middle. So on the right hand side, we have a large quantity. This must be multiplied by a smaller quantity. And similar on the left hand side, this smaller quantity must be multiplied by a large, larger quantity. So using this kind of intuition, we can get that P minus one needs to be greater. And hence, X squared plus X plus one needs to divide P minus one. Okay, great. So well, using that idea from this to what can we say? We can say that P is less than or equal to X minus one. And similarly, x squared plus x plus 1 is less than or equal to p minus 1, right? So, so p is obviously less than or equal to x minus 1. And from this, we get that p is greater than or equal to x squared plus x plus 2. That's really nice because now we have, we can basically form an inequality in just x, right? So x squared plus x plus 2 is less than or equal to x minus 1. So that effectively means that x squared plus 3 is less than or equal to 0, which is never true for any x. Therefore, this case has no solutions. Right? So this case has zero solutions. So basically, what was this case? This case was when p was dividing this quantity. The next case would be when p is dividing this other quantity. Right? So let me just let, let's say explore this case number 2. So case number 2, where p would divide x squared plus x plus 1. And this is probably even simpler because x squared plus x plus 1 can then be written as ap for some natural number n for some natural number a i'm sorry right so in the original equation we had p times p minus 1 is equal to x minus 1 times x squared plus x plus 1 right this is what we had obtained after factorizing it so p times p minus 1 would then become x minus 1 times ap right because x squared plus x plus 1 is equal to ap okay great so if I can just cancel this P on both sides, because P is a prime, it has to be non-zero. So that means, that means A times X minus one plus one is equal to P. Just making P the subject. Now I'll multiply by A on both sides. And the reason I did that is because AP is X squared plus X plus one. And once I open this left hand side, I'll get A square X negative A square plus A. And this is really great because I can just form a quadratic in X, right? So I can just form like a quadratic in X. And once I do that, I'll eventually get X squared plus X times one minus A squared plus A squared minus A plus one 
is equal to zero. And let's just maybe put that as equation number one. Now, for whenever we need to have certain solutions in natural numbers, the discriminant needs to be a perfect square, right? So for any quadratic expression, what's the discriminant? Is negative b, sorry, the discriminant, right? Square root of b square minus 4ac. And the root, the root, let's say the roots are alpha comma beta, they are of the form negative b, plus or minus square root of b square minus 4ac, or 2a, right? So basically, if these roots need to be natural numbers, this thing obviously needs to be a perfect square at the very least. It needs to satisfy certain other conditions as well, but at the very least, it needs to be a perfect square. Okay, great. So using the fact that b square minus 4 is needs to be a perfect square, if I just apply that over here, here we have basically b is equal to, b square would be 1 minus a squared, whole squared, and a would obviously be the leading coefficient, which is 1, and c in our case would be a squared plus or rather a squared minus a plus one, right? And just me plugging this in as k squared, I'll get one minus a squared whole squared minus four a squared minus a plus one will be equal to k squared. And we'll just simplify this a little bit. I'll get a is per four minus six a squared plus four a minus a to k squared. Now this is a very, very, very standard expression. Why? Because whenever I have a fourth power on one side, you see this quadratic with the leading coefficient one, especially whenever I see that in one side, the first thing that comes to mind is try and prove, do whatever, but try and prove that it lies between two perfect squares so that there exists no solution. And you can just simply say that that now notice, notice that a is per four minus six a square plus four a minus three. What we have, that's actually less than a is per four minus four a square plus four. I'm, what I'm essentially doing is I'm just investigating the perfect square that might be close to the left hand side that we have over here. And what I can also see is that a raised per 4 minus 6a square plus 4a minus 3 is actually greater than a raised per 4 minus 6a square plus 9. But notice that this only holds for a greater than equal to 3. Actually greater than 3. Because if you maybe plug in a is equal to 1 over here, especially in this inequality, you will actually see that the inequality does not hold true. The sign kind of reverses, right? But this actually holds for a greater than 3, both of these inequalities. So for a greater than 3, mind you, this is only for a greater than 3. We have a raised per 4 minus 6a squared plus 4a minus 3 lies between two perfect squares. Let me just call that as k1 squared and k2 squared. And over here, we itself want it to be a k square, right? And such that k1 and k2 are consecutive square. So for example, something like 11 square and 12 square. Can a square ever be between 11 square and 12 square? No, right? So therefore, we have no solutions for a greater than 3. But a is a natural number. So therefore, a can only be 1, 2, and 3, right? And a is 4 minus 6 a square plus 4 a minus 3 needs to be a perfect square. So at a is equal to 1, we'll get k square is equal to minus 3. So obviously no solution. At a is equal to actually minus 4. But regardless, you get no solution. So, but at a is equal to 2, you will get k square is equal to minus 3. And again, no solution. But when you plug in a is equal to 3, you'll get k squared is equal to 36, which gives a perfect solution. So a is equal to 3 is a solution. Now, let me just go back to an equation that I've written above. Right, this equation number 1 over here. So, from equation number 1, I had x squared plus x times 1 minus a squared plus a squared minus a plus 1 is equal to 0. Now, just put in a is equal to 3 over here. Look at a very simple quadratic expression, x squared minus x plus 7 is equal to 0, actually minus 8x, I believe, right? And if you just factorize this, x minus 7, x minus 1 becomes 0. So the only roots are, well, x equal to 1 and 7. And above, I had also written an equation that a times x minus 1 is equal to b minus 1. It really only comes from factorizing and putting x squared plus x plus 1 is equal to a, b. But if I just plug in maybe x equals to 1 over here, I'll have to have p is equal to 1, but that's not possible since p is a prime. And if I put x equal to 7, so a times 7 minus 1 is 6 is equal to p minus 1. So p is 6a plus 1. 
but we know that a is equal to 3 therefore p is equal to 6 times 3 plus 1 which is 19 and which is our only solution so yeah that was really nice and short problem and it involved some very elementary concepts in number theory so yeah i hope you enjoyed that okay so moving on we have some books that on the apm and senior olympiads and these are mostly related to number theory in algebra so we have the am compendium paul lomel's by parbeu and elementary number theory by siapinski okay so at the end we have a similar but challenging problem and i want you to find all a comma b comma b comma n such that a cube plus b cube is equal to p raised per n but p is a prime and a comma b comma n are natural numbers so you have cubes and primes over here as well but this is slightly more sophisticated so you might want to use some other techniques such as maybe uh, uh modular arithmetic maybe try and use something called a zygmunds theorem these are just some techniques that you might want to explore right so i'll leave that to you let me know if you're able to solve it or make any progress on it. And until then, I'll see you in the next video. Thank you very much and bye bye. The programs are designed for students who are passionate about mathematics. And they are personalized with one on one training, individual evaluation, and remedial sessions. The reason Chinta students are successful over the last 10 years because they are taught by mathematicians and real Olympiads from leading universities in India, United States and Europe. Some of our students come back to teach at Chinta from Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, MIT, UCLA, ISI, CMI, IITs, TIFR and IISC. For more information, visit Chinta.com.